I'm here with Andrew Tate, four-time kickboxing world champion. He's son of the grandmaster, chess grandmaster, Emery Tate. He's also a commentator, businessman, multimillionaire, all-around G. The website linked in the description is cobratate.com. And his YouTube channel, which I'll also link down below, is Tate Speech. And it's absolutely hilarious. Everyone needs to go and watch every single video on there. Andrew, good to have you on the channel. Absolutely, man. It's it's a pleasure to be with you. Such a fine gentleman such as yourself. <laughs> now, this is going to be obviously a relaxed chat. It's not going to be a structured interview, so people can watch it in the background. They can go about their daily activities and enjoy it. But I'm going to call it, Why Do They Hate Andrew Tate? I did a video the other day, Why Do They Hate PewDiePie? I'm going to do a series, I think, of why people who get in the public eye and are so castigated, so dragged down, what threat they pose to the media, to the establishment, so it's a broad question and feel free to take it off in any direction. But, you know, we're, we're constantly lectured in the culture about don't be divisive, never be divisive. The most interesting people on the Internet are often or al almost always the most divisive. And those well, are the people you, I want to listen to. interesting if you're run of the mill, you know, 50-50 sitting on the wall. How could you even be interesting? Like this, so many people are afraid of losing their career or their sponsorship or whatever garbage. They don't even have an opinion on anything. They're just, you know, little, oh, okay, yes, the, it's just, it's, it's insanity, so. No, I mean, there's a the, there's the whole breed of YouTubers whose job it is to sit on the fence and go, well, maybe you can entertain this opinion, this opinion, we all know who they are. And as he said, it's boring. Nobody wants to watch it. I don't want to watch it. But you're in the bracket of willing to stick your neck out the furthest on many issues. And you've done that on many different subjects in the past. You've got a web series called The Hateful Tate. Why do people hate you? Okay, well, this is, uh, buckle up, Mr. Watson. I hope you have an hour or so. Oh, yeah, but before I... you start, by the way, anyone <laughs> who's going to tweet me or send messages like, oh, didn't you see this tweet from him last year? I don't give a shit, okay? I don't give a shit. You don't have to agree with every opinion someone has to talk to them, okay? So get over yourself and move on. Go ahead. Absolutely. So, yeah, ev everyone hates me. So we agree on that. That's a good basis to start with. But, um, I think it's a combination of reasons. I think that one, because I think I embody the less liberal idea of toxic masculinity. I, I am their arch nemesis. I'm a six foot three kickboxing world champion millionaire who's openly sexist with lots of women who drives around his Lambo and doesn't care about social norms and refuses to listen to anybody. So in their mind, they're just like, I'm the, I am the opposite. If, if they're Spider-Man, I'm definitely Venom. You know, I'm everything they hate. I fight, I've got chicks, I've got money, I'm riding around in my car. So this is one of the reasons. And another reason is because I'm fortunate enough to be super anti-fragile. What, what normally happens is someone, you upset somebody, and then they try and upset you back. But no one can upset me. No one can get me fired from my job. No one can report me to anyone. Like, I'm, I'm out here in Romania at the moment, which is completely non-PC anyway. Like, no one can get me fired. No one can say bad things about me that are gonna make me apologize. I've never said sorry for anything I've ever said, ever. And they can't make me do it. And they can't make me care about them being mad at me. And that's what it really is. If you're mad at someone, the only person who's, the only person who has a negative emotion is you. If you're mad at someone, you're the only person harboring the emotion. I don't harbor the emotion if you're mad at me, I don't care. And they try and make me care and they can't. And then they just sit there poisoned and upset I hate this dude and he's just ignoring me. And then there's, you know, they have small genitalia and it all just adds up and they go upset. That's how it goes. And I'm still the man. Nothing changes. They can't get under your skin. You're the Teflon coated Tate. And that obviously relates to the, the depression issue, which we're going to get into in a bit. But I want to start with masculinity. Obviously, we had the Gillette ad. You did a parody ad of that, which I, I'm going to roll in the background while we're talking about this. Me too. You know, there was a poll, which I cite often. 25% of millennial men in the United States now think that asking to buy a woman a drink is a form of sexual harassment. 25%, one in four of US millennial men think that. Testosterone levels are plummeting. Soy consumption is increasing. Incels are now turning to violence. People criticize us for being misogynist, but you know, I've made videos criticizing incels and the, the crisis of masculinity, which isn't all the fault of feminism or the left. It's about taking personal responsibility. What's your core message to young men? And you've got several courses on cobratate.com that address this. 
What's your core message to young men who need to reassert their masculinity, but who live in a world where they're constantly told that it's toxic to do so? Well, absolutely. And this is, this is what's most crazy about it. While you were talking, you raised about 10 points I want to expand on. But firstly, what's most crazy about it is this. They tell young men to act a certain way. And they say, you must act more feminine. You must act, not act masculine. Don't be this way, don't be that way. And all that does is makes them unattractive to females. Like, let's cut the garbage. The garbage, there's gonna be some feminist out there who's overweight and ugly, who's gonna sit there and pretend she wants a feminine man. But in the reality, all women know they want a masculine man. So they're saying, oh, don't be this way, don't be that way. And all they're doing is saying to guys effectively is, you're never gonna have a girlfriend. And if you do, she's gonna cheat on you with Andrew Tate. That's, that's all they're saying. They're, they're literally setting these, these people up for failure in relationships, that's the first thing. Secondly, you're setting them up for failure in life. I mean, of course, there's some liberal garbage, SJW, left-wing Google you can work for. But in general, if you're gonna go out there and get a normal general job and be amongst men, you're gonna need a, a semi-masculine attitude and mannerisms and worldview. You know, men banter, we make fun of each other a little bit, it's fine. What's crazy about it is this, the feminists believe and the left believe that they're trying to demasculinize men to make men more like women. And in their mind, they're thinking, well, women are less threatened because women commit less violent crime. So if we make men like, like women, we're gonna have less violent crime. But they're ignoring two important facts. One, men, males, we're biologically programmed for violence. And that's because from an evolutionary standpoint, we needed violence to survive. For a long portion of human history, you needed violence to protect your wife and protect your clan and go and kill an animal. In fact, Paul, I think you did a video on this. There's many parts of the world still today where if you go and you're incapable of violence, you're gonna be in trouble. So violence is a necessary evolutionary skill that men have evolved. That's the first thing. So that's why men are more dangerous than women. And then they think, oh, well, if we break down men and make them more feminine, they'll just sit and watch rom-coms and they'll cry all day. No, what's gonna happen is you're gonna create men without self-control. Men without self-control are not sitting at home eating ice cream depressed. They're rapists and they're murderers. They're psychopaths, they're serial killers because we have a biological programming and you're gonna tell men they can't control their urges. Don't control your urges. Don't suppress your emotions. If you feel like running that guy over, you just get in your car and you just run him over. It's garbage. They think we're gonna turn, they think turning men into women is gonna create a bunch of crybabies and it will. But the opposite to a crybaby, the other end of the spectrum, is a violent psychopath. And that's why all these school shootings and such, it's some weirdo, cry incel dude, crying his eyes out, boo hoo hoo, next minute he turns up with an AK. How is that beneficial to society as a whole? Men need to be told to control themselves, control their emotions, honor, valor, courage, self-discipline. All of the old school masculine traits are the only thing that keeps society together because it's the only thing that even built society in the first place. I need a drink. I'm having a gin and tonic. I've, I've, I've upset myself. Which is, you know, it's not this cliched view of masculinity where it's some idiot meathead who's got nothing to say for himself, who's got no prospects, who just spends 12 hours in a gym every day. But the fact is, the bad boy image, it's not, it's not being a bad boy. It's having self-respect. That is the modern bad boy. Now, that's what it's got down to. It's basically just having self-respect. Okay, no women are going to be attracted to you. If you don't have your own interest, your own level of self-respect that doesn't revolve around chasing them. This yeah. is just basic, right? It's self-respect and it's sticking up for yourself and it's believing in something. Yeah. You've got to have something to believe in. You've got to be viable for standing up for something. The truth is this, man. Every time a man is needed, there's emotional control involved. You're telling me a firefighter when he runs into a burning building is not suppressing his fear. That's what makes him valuable. The fact that he's learned to suppress his fear, and he's doing it anyway for the good of society. Same with a soldier, same with a policeman, same with everyone these liberals are gonna call when shit hits the fan. Which is why men need to suppress their emotions, which we're gonna talk about the, with the depression thing. It's not always good to externalize your emotions as a man. In fact, most of the time, it's terrible to do that, right? Well, absolutely, man. Look, I've, I've had 85 professional fights, and I'll tell you now, I was scared before every single fucking one. I've seen five men die in the ring. I put a guy in a wheelchair for life. I know what can happen. I am scared. Do I show it? No, because why is that gonna benefit me? It's gonna give my enemy confidence. And, and let's forget professional fighting. You're walking down the street with your wife 
three guys come up to take her handbag. You say, you know what? Step away from her now. And you mean what you say. You can save her life without even throwing a punch. Instead of instantly going, oh, well, I feel scared now. And the feminist told me that, I mean, guys, I'm really intimidated. Please don't take her back. What kind of garbage land these people live in? It's just absolute privilege. We talk about all these imaginary privileges. They pretend that being white's a privilege. They pretend being man's a privilege, all this garbage. The real privilege is living in a first world country where you can sit around with so few problems that you can invent issues like men being men and cry about it all day. That's a privilege, garbage. And Matt, let's get into that now because we've come onto it. You know, I call it the depression industrial complex. I made a video called um, The Age of Emotional Incontinence. And it's not, it's not just a big pharma conspiracy to pathologize everything. That is going on to make billions of dollars from drug profits. But it's also this kind of global obsession pushed by the media, pushed by the culture, that we need to be emotionally incontinent, that we constantly need to talk about our feelings and cry all the time. The old uh, stiff upper lip thing, the British cliche, was generally true because people did grieve, they did mourn, but they did it privately because, again, to externalize everything and to have that constant track of victimhood rolling in your brain 24-7 is not going to lift you out of that situation. We're told also that there's a stigma around depression. There's no stigma around depression. People bang on about it constantly on social media, on television. And the more they talk about it in many cases, the more depressed they become. You know, it's like people talk about when they introduced death education into schools and suicide skyrocketed. The more, the more information that came available about, about means to commit suicide, the more that suicide skyrocketed in the West. Um, you know, people seem to think that just telling them to pull themselves up by the bootstraps, that that's, that's just a cliche. It's not a cliche. It's an entire branch of philosophy called Stoicism. You can read about it. This isn't some basic bitch fridge magnet, you know, philosophy. This is Stoicism. This has been around for thousands of years. The point is life is suffering. As soon as you learn to accept that, as soon as you learn to stop wallowing in your own circumstances, life becomes a bit easier. You become mentally stronger and you're better at dealing with bullshit. And that's the message you put across, right, Andrew? And you got crucified for it. I got crucified. But this is what was so great, like we said at the beginning of this video. I never, Paul, I want to promise you from the bottom of my heart, never for a single solitary second consider retracting my words ever because I meant what I said. And with a million retweets and every Hollywood celebrity in the world coming at me saying, can't wait till he apologizes, I sat there with a smile on my face because I'm right. So that's the first thing. The second thing is this. Here's the reality of the world, people. If you're watching this, you may not know this. So sit down and pay attention. Yin and yang, old Chinese philosophy, joy and pain, light and dark. There is no up without down. There's no such thing as permanent happiness because then it's not happiness, is it? You only feel happiness because you felt sad. You need the polarity to even experience it. This is what people don't understand. People are going through life going, I deserve to be happy all the time. You're not a child who has, you know, his a two-year-old who got a toy at Christmas. You're a grown-up. You've got responsibilities. You have things you need to do. You have pressure. You have commitments to fulfill. You're not going to be permanently happy all of the time. There's going to be times you feel a bit pissed off. And then that goes down to, then there's two types of people. The people who pull themselves up by the bootstraps, like you said, who think, well, I'm unhappy about my current situation, so what I'm going to do is change it. Or the people who go, I'm unhappy, it's not my fault, I caught a disease, I'm depressed, oh, no wonder I'm fat and live in my mother's basement, I'm depressed. No, you're, it's just complete garbage, and people use it as an excuse for things. I have it all the time, people message me and go, I'm overweight, what do I do? I say, go to the gym. They go, I can't because I'm depressed. I was like, you think you're fat because you're depressed. The reality is you're depressed because you're fat. You got the wrong way around. It's simply a situational feeling that's telling you you're unhappy with your situation or you're unhappy with certain circumstances and you need to change it. That's all it is. It's an evolutionary mechanism to prevent you living a life that, you, that humans are not meant to live. If depression wasn't situational, why do people not like going to jail? Because when you go to jail, you're in a situation which is depressing. It's simple as that. If we can be happy all the time regardless, then how come we all, don't just all go catch a case and sit in a jail cell and get three meals a day? How come if this is a universal disease 
Does it have country borders? Certain countries are more depressed than others. Why does it stop at a country? Surely it affects all the human race the same. No, certain countries tell you to get over it and get on with your life, and certain countries mollycoddle you. And when you're talking about the stigma, I come on Twitter and say openly, I have sex with multiple women. I have three girlfriends and a bunch of other chicks. And I get attacked. If I come on and say I'm, I'm, I'm depressed, everyone's on my side. If I say I'm a heterosexual male, then I'm the enemy. You, <laughs> you can't say that. You know, How you're, dare you? You're oh, happy yeah, right. and you're heterosexual and you're enjoying life. My God. A absolutely insane. The only reason anyone watching this video even exists is because at some point in history, a man had sex with a woman. And now I'm doing the same thing and I'm evil. But if I want to talk about being depressed and that all white men should die, that's perfectly acceptable. You want to talk about stigmas, there's stigmas attached to everything wrong in this life. There's absolutely no stigma around depression. Maybe if you're a soldier, you have PTSD, and it's called something else for a reason because it's a different condition. Or maybe like 0.1% of people are genuinely have something wrong with them. Most people just need to be told to get up and get over it. Man, when I was 16, because I was a kid and I was stupid, I was 16, I was miserable about some shit. And I remember saying to my dad, oh, I think I'm depressed. I remember him saying to me, depression isn't real. Go to the gym. And literally within a day, I was fixed. Because I went to the gym, I started training, and I never thought about it again. Imagine he said, oh my God, okay, let's take you to the doctor, let's see you in front of a therapist, let's talk about depression all the time, let's start taking these pills, start taking these pills that are gonna alter your brain, and you sit there and talk about everything bad that's ever happened to you ever to this therapist, and just sit there. Do you think I would've been cured in a day, or would I've been suffering, suffering from this imaginary garbage for years? And the other, the other thing is, Andrew, People do it for attention. With the rise of social media, you've seen the 10 paragraph, 20 paragraph Facebook posts with people whining about how, they de how depressed they are. They want attention, they're narcissists. So it's not just people justifying their laziness, it's people believing because you know their friend got some attention on social media for something else, maybe for doing something actually productive and creative maybe, then they get jealous. You have this thing where people are scrolling through other people's Instagram feeds, seeing that they're having fun, even though it's just a highlights reel of their life. That's not every minute of their life. Cool. Then they get depressed about that. So they think, oh, how can I draw attention to myself? And I've known people recently who just ascribe themselves, oh, I'm autistic, I've got disassociative disorder, or some bullshit, some anomalous bullshit, simply to make themselves feel special so they can then go around their little social group, so they can get, then go on social media saying, this is wrong with me, I'm a victim, give me attention. That's a big part of it as well, isn't it? Of course it is. It's, a, it's an instant path to uniqueness. I mean, you want to be, to be unique, you have to create some of the most interesting political commentary of our time. For me to be unique, I have to go and train and break bones and be a professional fighter. But these people want to be unique and they go, oh, yeah, but you don't understand what it's like to live with OCD. OCD, shut up, there's nothing wrong with you. You know what, man, I was watching TV with one of my ex-girlfriends a few years ago and there was a kid on there who had OCD and it was in Surrey or somewhere in England and the kid had to walk down the stairs in a certain order. He, he had to like skip one and then jump two and then go back up, whatever. And the parents were saying, if he doesn't do, if Timmy doesn't do the stairs in the right order, then Timmy gets really upset and he has panic attacks. And I was sitting there to this girl saying, this is invented and they're facilitating it and they're enabling him and telling and saying it's okay for him to throw a tantrum and it's imaginary. And she goes to me, well, how do you know it's imaginary? And I said, have you ever seen a kid in Africa walk four miles for water twice because they missed a step, ever? No, because it's not real. None of it's real. It's called enabling and facilitating. Talk about a stigma. The only stigma around depression is telling someone there's nothing wrong with their life and to grow up. And that's, yeah. what, that's, <laughs> of them. that's the only stigma. That's the only thing you'll get crucified for. And yeah, people do it to feel special. They've always got nothing else going on in their lives. They've got some shit dead end job that doesn't fulfill them all, that doesn't give them any creative purpose or fulfillment. So they say, oh, I'm autistic. I've got this disorder, that disorder. No, you're just, your life is shit. You need to improve it. Stop wallowing. Stop whining. Yeah, we all get down from time to time. But once you get over the hump of those situations, then stuff gets better. And it's called stoicism, okay? Read some Seneca. Uh, read some books on stoicism. They will help you. Whining about it, wallowing about it every day on social media, making excuses for your own shit life. You're never going to fix it. You're never going to solve it.
No, this is, this is what everyone wants to do. Yeah. Depression is the number one thing. But in general, the problem that plagues modern society in the West is that every single person wants to absolve responsibility. What they want to do is say, this situation that I'm in is shit, but it's not my fault. It's politics fault, or I'm fat because of my thyroid, or I'm depressed, or I've got OCD. Anything to take the problem, even people who are alcoholics or drug addicts are still trying to blame something else. You got up, you got dressed, you went to the store, you got fiber out your pocket, you bought booze, you walked home with the booze, and you drank the booze. And who else are you blaming? Like, is there not any point in that process where you stop the thought, maybe I should stop drinking booze? And you want to say you have a disease? I mean, this is just always is absolving responsibility. I said this to someone the other day. I said, if, if I can go through that process of buying alcohol and be an alcoholic, surely everything bad you do, every shit life decision you make can be a disease. Why can't I just go start stealing stuff and go, I can't control myself, I have a disease, I can't help it. Anything to take responsibility away from myself. And depression is the cure-all. With depression, you have an excuse for being unhealthy, out of shape, uh, bad job, uh, no motivation. Anything you can think of that's negative, you can go, ah, I'm depressed, yeah, so. It's just a, it's just a perfect excuse. That's all it is is an excuse. Totally. And it's saying that people enable it. They, people say, when someone says they're depressed, everyone huddles around them and goes, poor you, poor you. And it just makes them worse. It's stupid. And again, the more we talk about it, the more depression and suicide increases in the West, both men and women. So whatever people doing, it's not working. Anyone wants to debate you about it, they're welcome on this channel. I'll sit in and moderate it. I'll try and be neutral. Oh, no, oh. Anyone who wants to debate it, come and debate it. Let's talk about pussy hyperinflation, because this is something I've noticed. Good looking men. And I know some of these people. They're tall, confident, intelligent, good looking guys. Hanging around with fives and sixes and not just like fucking them, like professing love for them and shit. It's getting quite weird out there. We had an OK Cupid um, a release of some statistics which found that women found 80% of men to be less than average in attractiveness. 80% of men to be less than average in attractiveness. Bearing in mind, half of these women are going to be quite ugly themselves. Um, on Tinder, the bottom 80% of men in terms of attractiveness are competing for the bottom 22% of women and the top 78% of women are competing for the top 20% of men. So men seem to be settling for uglier and uglier women. Why? Well, firstly, I'd like to apologize to men as a whole for what I've done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's a problem. It's all and you. It's a, <laughs> and it's, you're, you're taking care of that 78% of women. <laughs> well, you know, bro, you know, I, I stay busy. I stay busy. <laughs> now, the, the problem is this. There's too much thirst. Here's the issue. Typically, in the old days, men gave attention to a woman to get sex. And the woman gave her sex back to keep getting the man's attention. That was the exchange. Attention, sex, sex, attention. Vice versa. Now we live in a world where women get attention for just existing. You can be basic. If you put a picture on Instagram, you're going to get a bunch of likes from a bunch of dudes, and your inbox is going to be filled. So male attention no longer has value. So what does a man have to give to get girls? Usually they used it in the old days a man gave his attention to get girls. That no longer works. So now what works? Well, either you're a super high value male where your attention is super valuable, like a famous, or you have a bunch of money. And I, that, that's where the top 20% is. In many cases, those two things go together. If you're a celebrity or a famous athlete or something. But that's what's happened. So now women are sitting around going, okay, well, I get hit up by basic dudes all day. I want something special. It's like, young lady, you ain't special. But they still believe they need it. So if you're a normal dude living a normal life, you're stuck with the fucking scraggles. And now it's all messed up. I actually have a course on my website and I teach dudes how to get girls. And the first thing I teach them is you need to reattach value to your attention. Because attention has no value. You need to do something to weaponize your attention again to get her to interact with you where you don't stand a chance. And that's what I teach. And that's how I got all these guys hitting me up saying, wow, you've changed my life all your life. But that's what basically has happened in the Western world. Anyway. And it's a complete mess, man. I, I don't know how most of these guys are out here surviving. It's, it's horrible. And that's how you have rise to all these 
webcam companies and all this default arena stuff because you've got basic dudes sitting at home, desperate and lonely. And it's just where it all comes from. The, the thing about the e-thought thing is a lot of these women who sit on YouTube with their tits hanging out, who sit on Twitch with their tits hanging out, begging for money, not even begging for money, they don't even have to ask for it anymore, they just sit there and it rolls in minute after minute from incels. They're getting the money. They're not even that attractive. Like, they've got sixes with big, ample breasts, who are quite actually saggy breasts in many cases, but they wear the push-up bra, and the money just fucking rolls in. Some of them are, are like preaching trad life shit, which makes it even more hilarious. But you've, as you said, you've got girls across social media. Some of them don't even sit on camera. They've just got Instagram pages, a Patreon link to it. They're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month just for dressing up in cosplay or whatever, making themselves look slutty. You know, do we blame the girls or do we blame the insults, the incels? What does it say about the state of manhood in today's society? that men are just throwing away their resources because some six on Twitch might DM them once a week. How pathetic is that? You know what I'm like? Because you are absolutely correct. One of my businesses, I have a few, one of them, I've kind of retired from the industry, but for a long time, I had a webcam studio. So I know this business inside out. I used to try and hide it, but everyone hates me. So here's the truth. Big misogynist Andrew, had 70 girls working for him. Oh no. You were paying women thousands of dollars a month, the horror, giving them careers. Oh my god. Such a sexist. They're, they're not all beauty queens, bro. They're just approachable, friendly sixes. And there's dudes out there who will spend money just for a woman to talk to. Them. And these guys, you know what I find a lot of the time? It's not, you have the lonely virgins, but what you get most often is the dude who's married in a sexless marriage, afraid of divorce because of the laws, his kids don't respect him, his wife hates him, and he waits for everyone to go to sleep and logs into his little computer. I love, I love you, baby. baby I, I really love you. I love you. That, that's what it is because they want the attention. People go, oh, why don't they get a hooker? They don't want sex. They want attention from a female. And if a woman has good personality, I used to say all the time when I was hiring girls, it doesn't matter what you look like. If you're friendly, you have good banter, and you have good personality, you're going to do good. And that's what it is. These girls are not sexually hot, and you can't blame the girls. The girls will sit there, talk shit, and make more money than a judge. I mean, what, like, are you going to tell them not to? <laughs> it's insane. Male thirst is so out of control that women profit from it insanely. And it's all over the internet. So when this whole, like, thought on it and all these things went down, it was attacking the girls. She's a hoe, she's a hoe. I'm sitting there going, I have girls who work for me who had, were married at 18, had one man in their life, had a kid young, tra trad life, literally genuinely trad life girls. But they're just making so much easy money that I call me a hoe, but I know I'm not. But this guy's just sending me money for nothing. <laughs> Can you blame the chicks? I don't blame the chicks at all. Yeah. And the other, the other thing is people, people ask me or people wonder, why do people watch Babe Station? Why do people watch all these TV channels with these girls writhing around on beds? Not even naked in many cases. Just writhing around. It's, it's barely even soft porn when they've got all the free hardcore porn at their fingertips. And that's exactly that. They need the connection. They need the conversation from a woman because they're not getting it in their own marriages, their own relationships. And that's what's sad about it. Also, I knew this cam girl who actually I'm going to try and get on the channel. I was going to get her on the channel. I'll probably do it now. Who, she's British and... She, she's, she's a cam girl, she's not on television, just a cam girl, and she said that most of the guys who want to chat to her, their fantasy is not to have her talking about banging them, it's to have her talking about banging somebody else, in many cases, you're half black, a black guy, and it's a cuck fantasy, and she said it was literally like 75-80% of the calls she got were men wanting her to talk about that. So again... That comes back to this complete wrecking of confidence, wrecking of manhood, wrecking of masculinity, that that's what they want to talk about, right? Absolutely, and I think a lot of fetishes are born of frustration. I mean, I'll tell you something now, man. I mean, maybe it's too much information, but whatever. I have so many beautiful women. I'm not into anything weird. I don't need to be into anything weird. I have beautiful girls. I like, enjoy normal, pretty much normal dominant sex with my beautiful women. If all you get is ugly chicks, or you never have sex at all, your mind's gonna warp and you're gonna end up into something weird. 
every single one of these dudes is into being a cop, licking feet, being insulted. We used to have guys go on there. I don't know who they were because they hide their faces. But they'd have like a Kuwaiti IP address. <laughs> they were obviously millionaires because they were sending $10,000 a week. And they'd be like, tell me, I'm, tell me you've never had sex with a Muslim guy. Tell me I'm stupid. Tell me I'm... Because they're so dominant in their own... Oh, so, no, I, I knew this other girl who um, straight up told me they told her they wanted her to piss on the Quran. That was what they were into. Yep. Loads of Muslims are into having Islam insulted. So it's just sexual frustration. Frustration ends up in some weird fetish. So the whole place is full of fetishes because you're full of sexually frustrated dudes. It's, it's, it's insane. So yeah, the cup thing's a huge thing. Like my girls who work for me, a couple of the guys when I used to run the company a couple years ago, they stalked my Instagram, stalked her Instagram, they put the connection together, they worked it out, whatever. And they'd be like, oh, how much to see him fuck? I'll pay anything, I'll pay anything. I never did it, but it's just crazy. Like, why do you want that? Like, why are you offering me five grand to get laid? Like, what? <laughs> it's just, man, the world is messed up. And it's messed up on a level you wouldn't believe. What's scary about it is this. These were like doctors, lawyers, people you trust. There was people you're supposed to trust in society on these sites. I saw it with my own eyes. Because thirst is biological. Men are evolutionarily programmed. We're programmed to want a certain thing. And the price of it is so exorbitant now for even the most basic version. The most basic version of pussy is so out, it's so badly outpriced. The guys just give up and go, you know what? This girl likes me. I'll just send her some money and I'll just jack off. And that's just literally how it goes. It's crazy. Now, female friends. You did a video called Tate on female friends. Um, I think I've talked about this before. There's a, there's a famous video on YouTube, I don't know if you've seen it, where this guy, I think he's walking around a college, he asks about a dozen men and a dozen women. Can men and women just be friends? All the women say, yeah, of course, no problem whatsoever. All the guys say no, because when they're honest, they don't just want to be friends, they want to bang them. Basically, unless the relationship is professional, unless there's a, a real practical reason for having to be in close contact with a woman and tell me if I'm right I'm guessing which way you're going to go on this as a man you will get fucked up and they will fuck you up on a regular basis if you have female friends unless it's professional as a man you can't have female friends right absolutely there's one really important point I forgot bro about the last subject and that is I'm sorry I have to drop this in one of my number one cam girls polled all her dudes who was pro-Trump and who was anti-Trump and there was like three pro-Trump guys and like 400 Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to make a point out there. It's the people who are so feminist, feminism, all that. They're the people who end up jacking off on webcam. They, anyway, sorry. I don't have female friends, and I don't have female friends, and I completely agree with you because I don't see the benefit. I don't, I, I don't believe, I know we live in a culture now, everyone's seen the Friends TV show. And we pretend that men and women have so much in common. We all want to sit around and talk about the same things. I never listened to two women, t women talking and thought, that's so interesting. Oh, wow. Yeah, I use Pan 10 also. Like, I'm not interested in what they care about. And they're not interested in what I care about. My relationships with females are purely sexual or purely professional. I cannot see myself going, oh, we're just friends. Let's just hang out. I don't see the benefit to it. On top of that, in my video, I made a point that women are not combat ready. And the reason I said that was this. I'll tell you a quick story. I was in a kebab shop was about five years ago in Luton. <laughs> uh, this car pulled up. It was a blacked out Audi. These four big black dudes got out. They walked straight to the front of the queue in front of everyone and just started ordering. And a guy was there with this girl. And the girl goes, Oi, there's a queue. And one of the dudes, even I'm a professional fighter, I knew it was trouble. So I just thought, who gives a shit? Like some people just aren't worth fucking. There's four, I'm one of them, whatever. So she goes, oh, I just cute. The guy turns around and goes, tell your girlfriend to shut up. And he goes, she's not my girlfriend, she's my friend. So even then I thought, man, you're about to get your ass kicked. You don't even get the, you don't even get the pussy. And she's running her mouth, you're your ass. Anyway, she talked too fresh and the dude got knocked out, clean in front of me. And I thought, you're hanging around with this mouthy chick who's your friend who can't even fight, and you just got your ass whooped. Like, this is why when I say women are combat ready, it's the truth. If, me, if, if I'm walking with, my met, with men, and something goes down, or someone attacks me, you have brothers with you who can help you. Women are just, oh, oh, can I say it? Yeah, I can say it. Women are useless in most situations. They're useless in combat situations. They're useless on 
in any kind of physical situation, but they want to walk around, take all my attention, expect me to buy them drinks and buy them dinner, and then not have sex with me and call me their friend. I don't see the benefit in any of them. The, the other thing is, which is even worse, when you make a female friend, when you make the mistake of making a female friend, and you don't want to bang them because they're quite ugly, but they've got a thing about you and you're not interested, then you've got a girlfriend, that's when they will fuck you up because your bros have your back, okay? They don't fuck you over behind the scenes. When you've got a female friend, her loyalty is not to you, it's to her other sisters. So she will talk shit about you. She will try and fuck up your life. That's why it's not worth it. Oh, absolutely, yeah, girl of power. I thought she deserved to know. <laughs> when, when, my, when my girlfriend texts my guy, is Andrew there? I always get caught because all of them say yes. Yeah, he's asleep. Like five different places. <laughs> <laughs> but at least you know they're doing the right thing, you know? Like, but yeah, completely right. You're, you're completely right. Women love attention. They absolutely and utterly love attention. And they love getting their own way. And if you have a female friend, and she, what, there's two dynamics. There's the one you described, female likes you, you don't like her back, then she tries to destroy your relationship. Or, the guy likes the girl, the girl doesn't like the guy, the girl pretends she's unaware that the dude's obviously in love with her, pretends, oh, we're just friends, I've known him since school, yeah, he buys me Christmas presents and pays for my dinners, but we're just friends. Like, it's just complete, it's just pathetic naivety, and it's just, it's put on, and it's not real. I don't need female friends. I don't, I don't, see, I don't need it. I don't really gonna help. I don't need it. There's a, there's a famous um, Facebook post. I put it in my Chad video, and it's um, a picture of a man and a woman. And it, the man's posted, we look like, because they're like, uh, quite a close together picture, like, we look like a couple here. And then the woman responds below, yeah, a couple of besties. <laughs> you got friend zoned hard in that. Let's let's move on to a not so uh, similar subject, but it actually is in a way, Islam. Now, Mike Cernovich got a lot of heat for this tweet a few days ago. He said, Christianity is given as a country where 11-year-olds dance for adult men who drew, can throw dollars on the stage to come out drag queen kids. Christianity gave us a church that molested children and sold out their flock, Covington to the left. A moderated form of Islam is probably the West's only hope. Quite, quite the leap to go from drag queen kids uh, to uh, a moderated form of Islam for the West. From my perspective, that's somewhat bullshit because... There's no such thing as moderate Islam. You know, 50% of moderate Muslims in the UK want to lock up gay people in cages. Um, massive numbers of them support suicide bombings in certain circumstances. These are the moderate Muslims. It was moderate Muslims that hid Abdeslam, the Paris massacre terrorist, for three months in Molenbeek while the police were looking for him. You know, Malaysia is the most moderate Islamic country on earth, yet it's rife with anti-Semitism. There's no such thing as moderate uh, Islam. But we have this problem in the West where we've got this nihilistic, meaningless culture. We've got community cohesion, family bonds weakening by the year. We have nothing to believe in for young people. Islam provides young people something to believe in. It provides people with those strong community family bonds. So you can understand why some people, even on the right, see it as preferable to this hedonistic, nihilistic, uh, meaningless lifestyle, which offers nothing, especially to young people, and just makes them fall into this, this cycle of degeneracy. You told a story on one of your videos where you went into a nightclub with a, a Muslim friend and his view of women. Tell us what he told you about the women in that nightclub and how that relates to Islam in the West. And I, I don't want to upset anyone who's watching the video, but I'll tell you the truth. Islam is one. In Western Europe, I believe Islam is one, and I am pessimistic. There's a lot of people who believe they can exist. I believe the fight is over. You cannot criticize them. They have strong community, and they believe in their faith above everything else. They don't care about country borders. They don't care about color. All they care about is their faith. On top of that, they br they're going to outbreed us anyway. They're having children young. We don't have children. Like, it's just on every level, they're winning the, the, the war if there is one anyway. I live currently in Romania, which is Orthodox Christian. It's overtly Orthodox Christian. And still to this day, I'll go on a date with a 22-year-old woman, and she'll say, I have to be home at 10, my dad says so. So I live in a country where family bond and religion still exists. And then when I go back to England, I can see exactly how much it doesn't exist. Because you see a 17-year-old throwing up on the pavement because she had too many pipes trying to get along with her mates. So everything you said is completely correct. We have com created a cultural void. Which is not saying that we want them to cover up and we, we want modesty culture. Surely there's a, a middle ground there, right? Absolutely. 
good reason makes me a middle ground. I think Mike's point was, his point was, I, I don't know if his point was the same as mine. I'm pessimistic about the view. I think that, especially in Europe, the fight's over. I really genuinely believe that. And I know this, I should be saying, we'll resist, and we will resist. But just by pure numbers, and the fact that they're so dedicated to their faith, nobody out here is dedicated to anything. Besides people like you and me, who genuinely stick our necks out, and are persecuted, and are, we cannot get a job, and we're not hireable, and we look at all the stuff we go through just to say half of the truth. Most people just shut up and be quiet, and they're not dedicated to anything. That's the end. That's the end of the whole situation, in my view. Plus, on top of all of this, on top of all this, what Islam provides is, not only does it provide a sense of identity, but you want to tie it to what we were saying earlier, Islam provides women. This is what that guy said when he said the guy went to the club. He walked in the club, he was a Muslim guy, he's a friend of mine, so I'm not racist, I have Muslim friends. He said to me, here in England you can find girls to sleep with, but you can't find a wife. So what do you mean? And he points to these two girls dancing with each other sexually in the dance floor. Would you marry her? And to be, I looked at him and he goes, oh, no. And he had a point. Under Islam, even if you're a beta, even if you're broke, even if you have nothing, we talked about all the problems of the beta and cam girls, we talked about it all. If you're all of those things, you still get a wife. And she'll still listen to you, and she'll still have your kids, and she'll still cook you dinner. Now, that's reason enough for a whole bunch of people to not give up the religion. That's reason enough. So what you're saying is incels should convert to Islam. <laughs> if you give up Islam, what have you got? Well, that, now I'm just a nobody. But under Islam, at least I have a wife. So there's a whole bunch of tenets to Islam, which makes it such a powerful force. And that's why it's so dangerous. Christianity is losing its grip. America's still a religious country. But in Western Europe, Christianity has no serious power in any, in any realm. In any realm. And we have this whole, I'm an atheist. And as an atheist, I still say I love living in a country that refuses to build mosques because it's a Christian country and they only build churches. I respect that because the country's built on Christian tradition. England needs to come along and say, we were built on Christian traditions, regardless of whether we still believe or not. This is a Christian country, Christian traditions. We're not building anything else. I don't think there's anything wrong with that because we can't build churches in their countries. So I, to me, I, I don't know. To me, it's like, I think they're, they're, what you said about it not being moderate is a fantastic point. I don't hate on Islam. I want to make it very clear. I'm not racist in any way. My view of the world is an ultra-realistic view that the weak get conquered and the strong survive. And the world has always been that. And, and they, have, they have stronger tribes. Our society is atomized to the point, completely atomized to the point where it's not a cliche. We don't talk to our neighbors. I, I walked past my immediate neighbor the other day, said hello, and he looked at me like I was insane. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, I know this is London, but come on. Maybe he's found out who I am, maybe it's some other reason. But... <laughs> this, is exactly, this is exactly the point. You said it perfectly, we're completely outliers. And this is the thing that's dangerous. And it's dangerous on every level, because when you, have a, when you talk about weak versus strong, no one can be weak, no one can be strong on their own. You're only strong as a unifying force. We can't even unify them for a flag anymore the flag is racist. We can't unify under anything. So you're left with these people who, I believe in the heart of conquest. People often say that America is the Native Americans land. Well, not really, because they lost the fight. You can't, you can't go through the world and say, well, they were here first, so it's theirs. Not really. If you lose the fight, every country- They were, they were killing each other in their own tribes before the Europeans ever showed up. And every country border on Earth, basically every single one has been defined by war. Someone won something, someone lost something, and the border was drawn. So conquest is a real right to land. So my view on the world is the weak, the weak get perish and the strong survive. If, if us, if the Western, if Western Europe as a society is so weak that they're gonna allow people at unlimited numbers to turn up and kill us with vans and do nothing but protect their ideology, well then, we're gonna get destroyed. And am I mad at the people destroying us? No. You have the, the strong are always going to pair, are always going to be, are always going to survive the league. So, to me, it's just, just kind of like, well, we've walked into it. That's my view. That's my I mean, th we had a story the other day about a comedian on BBC called Russell Howard, who is like the most safe, unfunny, woke comedian you could ever imagine. He wanted to make a joke about ISIS after the Charlie Hebdo attacks, and the BBC told him he would have to re-script that because they didn't want to offend. Islamic state. That's how bad it's got in the United Kingdom. We could go on for ages about that. Also, you've got progressives traveling to these Islamic countries, 
thinking that the world is a utopia, projecting their utopian uh, malaise onto other countries, and they end up getting beheaded, they end up getting raped, they end up getting strangled to death. I've made videos about this. Um, we also have another another breed of basic bitch travelers who go to these shithole countries trying to chase some authentic cultural experience just so they could come back and tell their friends how culturally enriched they are. Where they're literally going to places like New Delhi where they have to do UN training programs telling the population not to shit on the streets because it causes childhood diseases which kills thousands of children. Talk about basic bitch travelers because you've done videos about that too. Bro, man, these people are dangerous. These people are dangerous. For, they're either dangerous to themselves or they're dangerous to society. Because here's what they do. They live in a, a warped dimension. Where bad, where negative stereotypes about country are invented. Paul, you horrible right-wing individual, and me, Mr. Fucking Terrible, we've invented all these stereotypes about all these countries. We just made it up. We made it up because we're racist. And if you go there, it's actually perfectly safe. And then one of two things happens. Something terrible happens to them, and they have to learn the hard way. And unfortunately, in these kind of societies, they'd rather just kill you than let you go to the police. So in 99% of cases, you end up dead. Or, by some miracle, they manage to survive. And then they come back and they're even worse. Well, I went to Afghanistan and actually people were lovely. <laughs> no, what do you mean they're lovely? There's landmines. There's IED. No, I mean, uh, even in that story where they got killed, where they got mowed down by ISIS in Tajikistan, that bicycling couple who said, oh, the world, we just need to... Our view of the world as backwards in other certain more dangerous countries is just a reflection of our own bigotry and all this crap they put on their blog. I read their blog. In almost every Islamic country they visited before they got killed, they were harassed, they were stalked, they were robbed, they were physically assaulted. So again, it's not as if they didn't have any warnings. Ended up getting mowed down and stabbed to death by ISIS. So many other examples like that. But as he said, just uh, a lot of these, obviously most people aren't going to get killed, aren't going to get raped if they go to Morocco or whatever. So it's the ones who go... Um, not so far afield, they stay within like tourist bubbles and come back and say, oh no, it's really great, I don't know what you're talking about. As soon as you go outside the bubble, you're in trouble. Oh, absolutely. Let's, let's just stick to some realities of life. I, I don't like to call myself a sexist. I don't like to call myself a racist. I'm not a lipstick. I'm a realist. I'm a realist. Certain parts of the world are more dangerous than others. In certain parts of the world, I can walk down the street here in Romania with my blonde girlfriend in a skirt and nothing bad's going to happen. There's many parts of the world I cannot do that. And I understand that. That does not make me a racist. Does not make me a psycho. Doesn't mean, but people, when you say that to people, they're like, oh, well, have you even never been there? Like, I had to go try it out first. You don't know, people, unless you walk down through Baghdad with a couple of Playboy monies, you're not, you're not fit to make a, an opinion on it. Which, you've been to Iraq anyway, right? I have been to Iraq. I was in Iraq, actually, for some work. And you know what surprised me most about Iraq? It was, it was not as interesting as I expected it to be. It was kind of like, okay, I don't think that's how I'm going to die. But it was filled with Chinese people. The Chinese are just rebuilding the whole place. It's, it's crazy we spent American money bombing it to, to hell. And the Chinese picked up all the construction contracts and just get all the money rebuilding it. Could, it could have been in Beijing, bro. So many Chinese have been moving. So, because they don't care. They're not afraid of nothing. They're like, oh, well, how much? $10? Yes, you can buy. So, you know, they're, they're, they're there. So they're rebuilding the whole place. But yeah, many parts of the world are not safe. And that's perfectly normal. A lot of these travelers, I mean, I've traveled the world, especially with flight, I've been to 72 countries. A lot of people pretend traveling teaches you something. <laughs> and I actually disagree with that completely. A lot of people say, oh, but when you travel, you learn about yourself. What they're really saying is, I live in my parents' house, I have an allowance account, and this is the first time in my life I can do my own laundry. That's, that's all it is, is basic responsibility for finding somewhere to sleep and finding a way to clean your shirt. And sleep. Like, there's no, you don't learn anything traveling. Well, it's the old, it's the old adage about going away to find yourself and you just find out that you're still an idiot. <laughs> but they go to like Thailand and say, oh, it's such an amazing experience. Oh, just to come back and lord it over their friends like they've experienced some out of this world, like they've gone to the Jupiter or something. Everything's been done in terms of travel, unless you're going to go to the Moroccan hinterlands and get beheaded. I don't think anyone wants to do that. But your, your little Instagram selfie has been done by like a billion other people. Yeah, you can go on holiday and have fun, that's great, but don't come back and say that you went through this magical experience because it's bullshit, right? Yeah, all the time when I'm in Thailand, because I lived in Thailand for two years and I was fighting, and you have people there genuinely trying to pretend they're lost. 
<laughs> like, 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 I, I found this waterfall. I was just walking through Thailand. Every single waterfall sign posted. Every single waterfall has tourist guides. Every single waterfall has a, a mini bus that takes you there for two pounds. And then you get people who get there, and they're waiting for everyone else in the background to move out the way of the picture. So they can take a picture and then put it up and go, oh my god, I, I just found this tourist destination with 3,000 people in it. You know, it's just like, it's such, it's such manufactured garbage. I met a dude, and he had, he had long hair, and I was talking to him, I don't know why, I must have been losing my mind, and saying, oh, I started growing my hair when, when I came to Thailand. I said, like, why? He goes, oh, it's just easier, you know, when it's traveling, it's hard to get a cup. And my brother, he goes, there's a barbershop there. <laughs> That's because he wants to come back and have it as part of his image that he went through this spiritual transformation, right? They think they're, they think they're Robinson Crusoe. The number one tourist destination on Earth. Like, what planet are you on? <laughs> People to take it even farther, like you said, and end up in Tajikistan to be able to say, well, I actually went somewhere you've never been. But they got raped and beheaded. <laughs> How progressive. Let's leave it there because we've done, we've done well over an hour. Cobratate.com. Tell people about the courses you're offering and why everyone should get them. Yeah, I, I learned a lot in the web industry. So I've retired from the industry now. And I have courses. I have courses on how to pick up women. That is not in a horrible, evil, uh, pick up artist way. It's just what I've learned about girls working with so many of them. What I've learned about men, the men who are paying them for attention, and how you can have a better relationship with females. It doesn't matter if you're married, it doesn't matter if you're trying to get find a wife, it doesn't matter if you're trying to be a playboy, it's how to have a better relationship with females. I've got a whole bunch of courses on there for everything chess, fitness, I don't know, webcam studio, body language, everything's all there. I'm proud of absolutely everything I produce and I, I guarantee you it's there's some life changing information. So you check it out, I think you'll be impressed. CobraTate.com and the YouTube channel is Tate Speech. It's really funny. Everyone should go and subscribe to that. Links will be in the description below and we'll probably do some kind of live stream in the future on here um, for the subscribers as well. But Andrew, going to leave it there. Boom. Done. Please click the big red button to subscribe. It really helps me when you do that. And click the bell to allow notifications so you never miss a new video.